I knew by flight, it's just prolong my agony. Mm. By freeze, I would just still continue to be, become a victim. Mm. But fight, I will show them that I'm at apex. Mm. And it's kind of intriguing as well, because when I came out as well, I wanted to kind of like just explore London again, mm. because it's been such a long period of time. And we went to the aquarium, me and the wife. And everybody was just looking at all these kind of, you know, the, the different types of arrays of different, you know, animals and fishes and things such as this. Mm. And there was a lady and she was talking about a particular shark. And I was just transfixed. And I was just standing there. My wife was like, yeah, and I'm, I'm listening to her. Mm. And you know what she said? She said this, and it just reminded me of like our communities as well. She spoke about the tiger sand sharks. Mm. And this is what she said. She says that, you know, the tiger, um, the tiger sand sharks, she says that when the mother gives birth, mm. she actually gives birth inside of her stomach about 10 eggs. But she said, Do you, but how come she only produces one? So they have to fight. That's right. They fight for survival. Mm. So they eat each other. Mm. They annihilate each other to only the strongest one she gives birth to. Mm -mm. so then I understood within that community as well that I had to be the strongest one mm. so this is what I done mm. so then what I actually done was that's what we're taught as well you go for the biggest one you go for the toughest one you go for the one that they respect the most mm -hmm. and so that's what I actually done I approached that person with a rounders bat mm. and then um, first and foremost is I'm not promoting youth yeah, violence not glorifying mm. but that's your story but you know this is my testament yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, from there, and then I gained the respect from my estate. And That's then I why moved. I wanted to touch on why you became like this. So it doesn't just seem that you're just going mad. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? There's always, it seems, a mm -hmm. trigger point. No, definitely. Do you get 100%. what I'm trying to say? Especially when, like, because remember, we're all born with a blank page, innit? Mm. Some people's trigger points could be when they're bloody two years old, three. I don't know. But I'm saying, like, until that page gets madness, I don't know. That's when, yeah, but your trigger, boom. No, that definitely. Point. And it was actually, it was eye-opening. And it was good for me as well, because I came from a big family. And my family were quite known as well. Mm -hmm. So like the Pattersons, <coughs> like there's a lot of us. So, you know, like it came a stage where even my older brother was saying that, I'm not going to bail you out. You're going to have to toughen up. But then me and my brother, years after we had a conversation, he says that when I said for you to tough her, I didn't mean for you to go just <laughs> mad. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go fuck wild. <laughs> my mm. brother said that, like, wow, you just took it to a whole different level. But, you know, my story is not unique. Mm. As you know already, you've sat down, you've conversed with many individuals and you've spoken to them. And have you noticed know, something that's quite scary, that all the stories are kind of similar. Very. They're all the same. It's like clones. We want to be something different. I'm not, to be fair, um, mm. I came onto this podcast as well because I obviously, I trust Spray. Spray is a good friend of mine and brother and I love him for the sake of Allah. Mm. But also I want to do something different because you know what it is? People have this false preconceived idea on how black people are mm. and how we conduct ourselves. And So for example as well, I, I see this all the time even like where I'm working, you know, they call it trying to be friendly or trying to. You've got a new job now. We're going to get to that. Part. Mm, yeah. We will. Some, uh, sometimes, especially when you're dealing with other cultures as well, and they would, they would, they would do things. Not even sometimes it, they could, maybe they understand what they're doing. And sometimes they don't out of naivety or stupidity. But for example, this gentleman out of nowhere, so I'm actually a receptionist. I'm doing sales and marketing. I'm talking to him about certain products for him to, you know, for him to buy. Then he's like, uh -uh. Wagwan. So I, look, I looked at him. I just pay, I'm just paying attention to him. So I mm -hmm. said, yeah, hello. <laughs> don't be trying to, don't be trying to pigeonhole us. Don't be trying to stereotype us. What do you know about Wagwan? <laughs> exactly. So this is it. I know that you're trying to undermine this. Not even like, because we know that, look, we live, in, we live in a community as well. And even some family friends as well. We know that some Caucasian people have the Afro-Caribbean spirit in them. So we know this. It's not, it, we're not talking about on a race thing, but we know that this particular individual, you're far removed from our community. You're just trying to undermine me here. Hmm. So. You tried it. 
No, definitely, hundred percent. Hmm? You have to hold it down. No, it's not even. And you know them mad ones that I know about. Like, it's not mm. even so much that because we don't have that kind of primitive way of thinking. Mm, but you know what it is as well. They don't, enough people, enough normal guys here. Yeah, they don't realize that. Not even that he's a maniac, but I'm saying there's some mad man out here that don't trouble them. Because mm. you see them man, they like see enough of them delivery man. Them they're coming from the bin, you know, and they're driving up and down. And but they're coming from madness. You get me? And then you got people that will deal with them a certain way, mm. but you don't even know. My man will really, but well, that's not what we're promoting. <laughs> Boom. Mm. Let's go back to secondary school. Did you start getting in trouble and all that with the police? Yeah, so, so what actually happened was, I think how we, how we actually started as well. Again, I have such a massive family and there was some family that I didn't even know they were my family initially. Right. So what was actually happening when my brother used to come and bail me out, he says, you know what? Because I can't, I'm not always around. I'm going to introduce you to your cousin. So it was actually weird. I remember I used to see these other group of kids and they had all the kind of latest things. Mm -hmm. like they had all the like, you know, latest Fazar cheese, they had everything. Mm -hmm. And there was one particular and he just had so many people around him. And I was like, I'd like to be like that. You know, you just see that, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, you're just thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like to be that. But Ooh. I didn't know that that was my cousin. Right. So when I was introduced, he actually embraced me with full arms. Hmm. And he says, like, just, you know, come along, just hang around with us. And um, from there. And I think that was, that was the trigger in the sense of, like, criminality as well. Because, you know, what's kind of crazy as well. I look back in my life as well and I said, okay, I dealt with the person that was kind of suppressing, oppressing and depressing me. But then I became the very same thing that I said that I would never and that mm. I was fighting mm -hmm. against. And it's kind of crazy. And then, you know, you start your little street robberies, mm. but then, you know, you're trying to intimidate other young people. You're trying to let them know that you are the alpha. Mm. And yeah, so I think my record is very small because I've had two long sentences and I say, I'm the unlucky one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how, how old was you when you hooked up with your, with your cousin? So I was 12. Okay. Year eight. Oh, year eight. So mm, when, when you yeah. went IT centre, you never went back into secondary school? No. Okay, so did you never got to take any exams or anything like that? No, nothing at all. Nothing. And considering my how... Edu my education stopped then. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. It was, um, and it was crazy as well because there were so many kind of missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard, there was this um, private school called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So when we was, and Westminster Boys. Yeah. Actually, because you know that... Yeah. You know that you have to take an uh, entry test in order to determine whether you fit the criteria for those schools. I actually took those tests and I actually passed. All right, cliche. Yeah, grammar school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what it is yeah. called, isn't it? Grammar, yeah. yeah. And um, I actually went into the school, I actually had an interview with it and they were just, I remember a guy with my mother as well and they were, the headmaster, I can see that he was indecisive as well, like the person that was speaking to us and he was just like, his grades are very good. Like he's a very intelligent pop up. We can't take a chance with him. Mm. His behavior. So from so from there, you can kind of you can kind of see how things have started in motion. Does that make sense? And I I look I look back and I actually converse with my parents about this. And I know that some of our elders may not want to hear this as well. And I hold no apologies. But what I, what I will say to them as well is, please listen carefully to what I'm actually saying. Now, sometimes what we tend to do as well, we tend to put our children into um, institutions like the education institution and be taught by people that all their lives they've been mm. breastfed on preconceived ideas on how certain particular groups of people are. And you wonder why that we're underachieving. Mm. Because... They choose not to understand us. They don't care. And what we're actually doing as well, we're, we're actually sacrificing our children. We're actually giving 
putting them in the hands of these people because the likelihood is it has to, um, the dynamics has to work mm. because as parents as well, you know, as adults as well, we have to work. So majority of the information that the child is going to be receiving, to be honest, it's going to be from the teachers. Exactly. So I've said this before, isn't it, Spray? Not all teachers are bad. Not all, we're not saying that. We're talking not about a system. RIP, That's what mom. we're talking about. RIP, my mom There's some the great, teachers. amazing teachers. Mere but what I'm teachers. saying is, especially from where we're coming from, there's a, a big number of teachers that don't understand us. They're number two, black. it's not even just back. It's like the culture. Number, It's even learning styles, like you just said. This one wasn't very good. He couldn't read properly, but he can do things with their hands. School is where you're in school from a certain age group. Mm. You have to go to school. And it's like, if unless you're academic, then you don't get by. Do you understand? 101%. They They throw you out and then they put you in these, um, you know, like IT and PRU and all of these things. And they know what road you're going to. It's like they literally divert you down the wrong street. Do you understand? Because you've got bad behaviour. Because you're not learning in the way that they want you to learn. You've got bad you're diff everybody's different. Do you understand? Well, IT, well, so they need to have different different parts of the That's school. That's why you've got IT though, because you've got bad behaviour. Yeah, but it's and not just about bad behaviour. Some people no, have got short attention spans. Some people are ADHD. Do you understand big what I'm saying? The, um, there's not a lot of them, but big up the black head teachers. Some of them are dyslexic. Yeah, Hundred percent. Do you understand what, what I'm saying? There's a lot. There's a lot. So when you're dyslexic and you're in the classroom, or you might even, you might not want to be vocalised and even ask the teacher stuff, you start acting out in a different yeah. way. We're speaking from being adults. When you're a child, you're going to express it in a different way. Big up Solomon. Do you understand Bricks what I'm saying? Plus, what it, saying. it affects your confidence as well. 100%. And then if you keep getting thrown out the classroom and that, you create a complex on that child. You keep telling the child they're bad, they're going to go bad. Do you mm. understand what I mean? Hundred percent. We all know that. We yeah, no, know it's this. true. But self fulfilling prophecy. Some teachers are good. You get me? Big self fulfilling up. prophecy. And you know why? You've actually struck a chord there. Because you know what? When I was in primary school, when I was in um, St. George's as well, you know what the headmaster said to me? Hmm. And remember, how can you determine the outcome of a child? Exactly. When you're still a sponge. We, hmm. we understand the most formative years is from what's it, one to seven. So how can you then turn around to the child and he says, you know what, you're going to end up dead mm. or in prison? Mm -mm. That's what he said to me. So automatically, they were actually paving out what was... right. Hmm. So he ended up in prison. The head teacher was right. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you're a free... No, but all I'm saying, mm. he said what he said and you ended up there.